Hello lovely people, welcome to another episode of Book Chat, my weekly roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. Sophie Vlogs! I've got a largely like non-fiction selection of stuff to talk about this week. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of fiction. Um, I did read um, this series which is Barbarella and Deja Thorne. It's only about five issues, oh it's four issues, it's really short, but it's a, f it's a fun little comic run. Essentially like Barbarella and Deja Thorne, who are both two like quite well established characters within the comic world already. Essentially Barbarella's supposed to meet this like scientist dude. When she arrives he's just died, but he's just left a note and essentially she follows this note, it leads her to this big mirror, she ends up falling through, as does Deja Thorne, and then like this guy has sort of left them a thing they have to achieve. This is a fun little one-shot dabble. I really enjoyed the sort of relationship that develops between the two. Um, I thought that was a really lovely touch. For only being four short comics, I feel like um, it has like a really great, like well-contained little story that it like executes really well. And I just, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was just like a really nice little like one-shot what would these characters interact with each other like? What is this like plotline like? And I just, I thought it was fun. Um, after that, um, I don't, I never know whether to class these as fiction or not, but I also read Northern Lights, Legends, Sagas and Folktales, edited by Kevin Crossley Holland. This is just a selection of Legends, Sagas and Folktales from the Norse. So a lot of this is, um, like Norse mythology based. There's like myths in the first half, then there's like excerpts from sagas, and then there's like some other, like just small, like folktales. So it's like split by section. Um, I don't really have a lot to say about this one either because it's just a selection of folk tales. It's not written by Kevin Crosley Holland. He's gathered um, from other authors and like established like folklorists or like for example excerpts from sagas that exist. So he sort of like gathered a lot of things into one place. If you're someone who's interested in like Northwest Europe mythology, this is quite a good little starter. Next up is a book that I have a lot more to say on. I promise this isn't just me being like I read this thing. I have no thoughts. Um, I read Wild Swans, Three Daughters of China by Yong Chang. This was such a good book. I've been really enjoying reading non-fiction that is like someone's life and experiences and that sort of thing, but that also helps me gain a better understanding of some history that I don't know anything about. So for the Asian Readathon, I read um, Life and Death in Shanghai by Nian Cheng, which is her experience during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. This is um, looking at three generations, so it's looking at Yong Chang, her mother and her grandmother. Um, her grandmother was um, married to a warlord, well, her grandmother was courtesan to a warlord, but he actually also married her as like a sign of respect. Um, she had uh, Yong Chang's mother very young. Her grandmother's life covers a, covers a period of time. Um, she lived in Manchuria and um, it was, it focuses on the period of time where China was occupied by the Japanese. Um, that then moves into the Kuomintang uh, government and then also the uh, Communist Party coming into power. Um, her mother was very involved in the Communist Party, um, as was her father also. Um, so her parents were very involved in the Communist Party. And then um, it also follows Yong Chang, who was a teenager during the Cultural Revolution. Um, this is all history that, to be honest with you, until I read this book I didn't really know anything about because my Chinese history is not strong at all. Um, this was a really fabulous way to learn history because, like, this covers such a broad period of time. I think she does, she does like such, because it's like her family, it's such like a um, really like compassionate telling of everything that happens to them. A similarity between this and um, Life and Death in Shanghai is I both felt like they were like really clear. <laughs> Which is like a silly thing to say, but sometimes like memoirs can be very concerned with the personal, which is lovely. Um, and then you only really get glimpses of like wider picture as they relate to the personal. Whereas I felt like what this did is um, it is all tied back to the personal. You are following these particular people, but also um, I appreciated just also getting this wider picture of stuff that's going on slightly wider that might not directly affect them, but then like it does have like ripple effects and repercussions because you know that is what tends to happen when you are alive during events. Um, another thing that I found really interesting is her growing awareness. So like she grew, she grows up during stuff like the Cultural Revolution and I went into this with 
all of the knowledge that I had gained from reading Life and Death in Shanghai, and Yang Cheng was an older woman when the Cultural Revolution happened, and she had her own particular experiences in it based in Shanghai. Whereas um, Yong Chan's family is based in a completely different part of China, so that was really interesting to see, just like a comparative difference between how this one event affected two different places, because China is so huge, um, and then also, like, she's very young. Um, when all this stuff is happening, she just, of course she believes everything she's been told, because she, why would she not? Whereas Yang Cheng was obviously um, very um, critical, because, uh, you know, she's an older woman, she's been accused of things that she didn't do, she's like a political prisoner, so obviously she's coming in from a much more critical standpoint. Whereas what was interesting was to see Yang Chang's growing awareness what are the things that happen that make her question the information she has been told? Um, and also, like, just getting a wider picture, like, in Life and Death in Shanghai, I got a lot more of an understanding of, like, um, disputes between individual people involved in the Communist Party and how that affected um, stuff going on there. This was a lot more like the wider economic policies and, like, for example, um, the massive food shortages that came about because they were given these really ridiculous targets that they couldn't have met and um, in order to satisfy like the targets they were given like they'd have like fields of potatoes and then they would just like when an inspector came they would just move the potatoes from field to field to make it look as if they have these amazing harvests because that's what they've been told they need to do um, and so then when the food shortage came in um, where Yang Chang is living, they've been told that there's been all these natural disasters that are unprecedented and that's why there's a food shortage. And then it's only later when she's a teenager, when she goes out to the countryside to do um, work in the fields and that sort of stuff amongst um, the peasants, that then they, she asks them about these m massive disasters and they're just like, what are you talking about? That, no, what are you, that didn't happen. And it's like, what are the moments that are the moments that make her question the information she's been told? Um, I don't know, I just thought that this was just, I gave this 5 out of 5 stars, I don't think I can do justice to how much this book covers, I just think it's a really fantastic memoir, um, if you're someone who's interested in learning a bit more about Chinese history, or if you're someone who really enjoys reading memoirs and autobiographies, I just think that this was absolutely fantastic, and I thoroughly, like, enjoyed it seems like a weird word to use, because, like, some horrific things happen, like, I'm not going to say that this is a book that is always concerned with, like, joy and happiness, because, like, no, like, there's a lot of suffering in this, because, like, three generations of her family went through a lot of stuff, but I do think it's such a worthwhile read, and I think it does it in a way that I found it very clear, as, again, I know that I'm coming into these texts as someone who doesn't really know a huge amount about this history, so I'm sort of dependent on the text to fill me in on stuff, um, and I just, I thought it was just done really well. The final book I want to talk about is one that I read on my Kindle, that is Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? which is a uh, collection of essays by the Truth Out, um, I'm going to call them corporation, that's entirely the wrong word, collective, sorry, words beginning with the same letter apparently confuses me. This is just a series of essays that's all about, like, essentially police brutality. Um, it's very much focused on America. Um, it's like the first half of the collection is essays that are sort of like exploring explicitly what the issues are. Like, for example, one essay was focused on the particular type of abuse that like pregnant black women face. Um, there was another that's on to do with um, a lot of the conflicts on the border between America and Mexico and the particular issues that happened there. So um, the first section is a lot that is just like exploring police brutality and police wrongdoing. Each essay is by a different contributor. Um, and it just was, it was useful to gain a better understanding with like facts and figures and that sort of thing to like back up this stuff. And then the second part of the collection is kind of like, what do we want to do from here? So like, for example, when people talk about like defunding the police, like what does that mean? What would that look like? Also stuff like one essay was about um, how can black activists and indigenous activists work together well? Where are the times in the past where there have been conflict between these two groups? And going forward, how can they work together in a cohesive way and that will be beneficial to both groups that face similar issues but also different issues? Um, that sort of thing. I don't have a huge amount to say on this collection other than 
it was an excellent collection and I'd really recommend it if you're looking for some more information on this topic. Going forward, I would like to make sure that I'm also reading um, texts like this which are to do with the UK where I live because it is really useful for me to get a better understanding of what the situation is in America, but I also don't want to be like, think of this like it's an American problem and that there's nothing that could be done over here. So there are a number of books that are on my radar that I should be reading that are to do with like the UK and that sort of stuff. But um, I think it was a really great collection. I really appreciated having each essay be from a different contributor because I felt like um, everyone comes in with their own knowledge and experience and specialties and that was a really great way to make sure that like a lot of topics are covered within one collection. Um, but yes, that's everything I wanted to talk about this week. Um, as per usual, I would love to hear if you have any thoughts on any of these. Um, otherwise, I hope you're having the loveliest of days and I will see you next time with something different.